Hello and welcome. I'm Michael Pierce for The Human Condition. Today we are doing Chapter 2, Clinical Concepts of EEG and ERP, which is brainwave measurements, uh, ultimately leading to QEEG and neurofeedback and other methods that look at brain waves and how they relate to your health. So um, functional medicine and standard medicine have different goals. Standard medicine is designed, or orthodox medicine, is designed to have a rock-solid diagnosis. You're either sick or you're not. And then a treatment that is validated, that is um, um, evidence-based in such a way that it doesn't create fraud and that society will pay for that treatment without it being um, spurious. And so there is a reason for orthodox medicine or standard medicine to have those standards. Because we don't want to treat someone who isn't sick, especially if the methods are invasive or, or uh, have side effects that could be dangerous. We want to prove that they are sick enough to be treated by uh, risky methods like surgery and drugs, which have massively large side effects. Now, that's called the risk-benefit ratio. The ratio has to do with how risky is the treatment versus how big is the benefit if, they, if it works. And so um, this risk-benefit ratio changes for functional and alternative medicine in that as long as the disease isn't life-threatening or, or urgent or, or acute, the, the risk of the treatment in alternative medicine and functional medicine is very, very low. And the outcome or benefit may not be high, but it may not be low. But the neat thing is that ratio of risk to benefit is much more favorable often in functional or alternative medicine, complementary and alternative medicine. Now, complementary and alternative medicine and functional medicine are not free of the obligation of evidence and science and, and, um, and standards. We can't hold them to exactly the same standards, however, because the expense of, of proving causation for uh, every medical condition is not possible, and economically it would bankrupt every country. So what we have to do is ask ourselves, what is the standard of evidence for um, diagnosing and treating a patient when a patient presents with a symptom? And um, one of the first things is we have to correlate physical findings, which are objective findings that the doctor would examine the patient and find on their person, on their body, lab tests, imaging tests, and of course the history. And the history, they could lie, but generally patients are not, are not generally lying unless there's a, a reason for them to lie. And, and we, we have that, and that's, that's for another discussion. But in most of the cases, the patient isn't, in, isn't interested in lying. And so we have the history as well, and, and a, a very intelligent history taking that's done in an investigatory fashion uh, is, is very useful, and it can, it can glean a lot of information. And then what's most important is that the doctor and patient come up with an etiology or a, or a how did this develop? How did this problem develop? How did the patient get in this, in this, this mess? And how um, are they going to get out of it? What's the mechanism of action? So the theory of, of how they got there, the etiology, the mechanism of their illness, how did they get sick and what pathways are involved, physiologic pathways, biochemical pathways, anatomical pathways, which ones are not working and which ones are working. And then finally, an actual um, hypothesis, a clinical hypothesis of what do we think is wrong, what intervention do we think will work to, to help fix it, and what would the outcome measure look like. And, uh, and if we do that, that's clinical science, and that satisfies most of the requirements of clinical science. So in the world of EEG and ERP and, and QEG, this concept of, of electroencephalography is one where we're trying to use objective measures that are reproducible time after time, that can be compared to other people, and that can be compared over time to our individual patient from a baseline and from an evolving set of data over, over time, um, you know, time one, time two, time three, time four, we can begin to then compare and see, is the patient getting better? Is the patient trending toward worse? And so those are ways that we understand uh, if the patient is getting better or worse. Now, these concepts don't fully, in alternative medicine, meet the criteria of pathology. Because in medicine, they are looking for pathology. They're looking for evidence of tissue damage. And the classical definition of pathology is, can I perform an autopsy on the patient, take out a tissue, and show a pathology? Now, that works in most cases of disease. But it doesn't work in functional illnesses where something has deviated from normal and there isn't enough pathology to see in evidence with imaging. Like, for example, autistic brains are very hard to assess in the living patient. Um, they're hard to assess in, in the deceased patient as well. They're hard to assess in autopsy. But there is, there is some 
physical evidence in, um, in new research on, on autistic brains versus typical brains. However, there are many conditions where a person departs from health and they are not well, but they, are not, they don't qualify for a classical diagnosis. Do they deserve treatment? I think in most of the world we would say yes, they deserve treatment. They're suffering individuals, there's something wrong with them, and we have the ability to heal them and help them heal. Um, we don't really heal them, but we have the ability to facilitate healing and let them heal and recover. So there are a whole host of functional illnesses that are outside the range of, of standard pathology, um, and so we're looking to measure what's wrong with the person without it being a pathology. And just that alone is going to, is going to you know, kind of rub um, pathologists the wrong way and, and rub diagnosticians the wrong way because it doesn't really qualify as a medical necessity in, in law and in reimbursement and in a lot of governments, it doesn't qualify. So we have to decide as a culture, every country has to decide where are we going to draw the line between early detection functional deviations, and eventually, ultimately, what is the prevention of illness? Because that's a dirty word in the United States. We can't say prevention when we talk about clinical science. The researchers can say that in their papers, but doctors can't make any claims in literature or in writing about um, what is a prevention and, and what, what methods are preventing future illness until we absolutely prove that. And unfortunately, in the United States, it's tied to the drug industry. So um, that steers us toward the really next thing, which is evidence-based medicine. And evidence-based medicine really has to do with, you know, four levels of, of evidence. And I'm not going to go into that in this particular lecture, but um, evidence-based medicine has to do with the, grading the quality of our evidence. And, um, um, and right now, modern medicine, orthodox medicine with drugs and surgery, really tries to focus on the highest level of, of cases that, that go beyond really epidemiology that go to reverse controlled double blind studies. And there just aren't a lot of those and it's very hard to afford those. So I think that with, with functional medicine and, and alternative medicine, you're going to see a whole lot of studies that are lower on the, on the hierarchy of, of evidence quality. Now, it doesn't mean that the evidence is useless, it just means that it, it's not causative. Now, I think you'll find, and I think you'll agree with me over time, that um, if we spend a lot more time and information on these lower tier evidences that aren't reverse controlled, um, placebo controlled, reversed uh, double blind studies, and we correlate them with econometrics, which are studies of happiness and health and wellness and, uh, and productivity and money and cost of, of care and cost of recovery and cost per capita and all of those types of things, we'll begin to see if we put those two sets of data together that we can approximate a really good and healthy society that's happy that's just not based on how much money we spend on healthcare, because that's not gross domestic product, that's gross domestic happiness. So we will be using uh, evidence, but we're not using evidence-based medicine as it's defined in a hospital. So EEG and QEG works very, very well because it's reproducible, it's comparable, we have Z-scores. Z-scores are something where we can compare an individual to uh, thousands of normal uh, brains or healthy brains. We can also compare them to uh, a standardized set of people that have a known illness. We can say these are traumatic brain injury cases and we can do discriminant analysis, which is a statistical measure. And then I mentioned me medical ethics already and medical ethics is this, this conundrum where a doctor is trying to decide, do I have enough evidence or proof that I'm not treating a, a phantom, that I'm really going after something real, but yet I don't wanna waste the patient's money and try to prove a diagnosis when they have a functional problem anyway and there never will be pathology because they're not sick enough yet for pathology. So to have enough evidence to justify treating them with some intervention, like a dietary change or a supplement or a, um, a, a neurological rehab exercise for their brain, a specific region of their brain, or, or neurofeedback to, to aimed at normalizing their brain waves back to some particular goal. So I think the medical ethics have to do with tying not only our outcomes to measurements like brain waves, but also measurements of patient quality of life, activities of daily living, and especially symptoms. Did the patient's symptoms improve? Did the patient's demeanor improve? Does the patient's um, mood improve? There are a whole number of standardized psychological batteries we can use, instruments that are, we used to call them paper instruments, but they're usually now on a tablet or a computer, and they're standardized tests that are either administered by a professional doctor or psychologist, or they're self-administered, depending on their standard of, of quality. And there's just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of those kinds of standardized tests that are used to measure all of these different people. So if we can triangulate the econometrics, the money side of wellness, 
the low level quality of evidence, which is less expensive, but certainly broader and involves more people and therefore has more statistical power. And the third thing, which is the psychometric and quality of life and, and essentially questionnaire or paper-based instruments. Those three systems should be able to help us triangulate in a very, very clear way what is real functional medicine versus charlatanism and, you know, hokum. And, uh, and nobody wants that. Um, I, I want us to be between this medical industrial complex over here where we're profit driven and we're, we're absolutely evidence based and we spend a ton of money proving that somebody truly has something wrong and we ignore all the, all the walking wounded and the pendulum swing over here where we're completely ungrounded. We're, um, we have no basis, no evidence for what we're saying. We make all kinds of claims that no one can validate. If I'm a magical practitioner who claims that I see you know, unicorns coming out of the patient's head, I can't prove that, I can't reproduce that. And whether I believe it or not, or I have an, a special ability or not, nobody else does. And there's no way to validate me. There's no way to prove that if I'm a charlatan or if I am, if I am um, earnest and true. So we got to have objective findings. We got to have methods of measurement that everybody can agree on, even if they aren't causation driven, even if they aren't causation determining. determining. So um, the last part of this, of this section really has to do with which clinic department takes priority. If you take a brainwave of a person, a measurement, and you're, and you're all into those brainwaves, and the person has a bunch of artifacts showing up, which is, um, artifact is any kind of, of signal that is not from the brain, like your face twitching, or your eyes twitching, or your eyes moving around, or you're swallowing, or you're moving your tongue. Some artifactual type of, of image that shows up on the squiggles that is uh, bad data. We don't want this bad data. So if we focus on all of that bad data, we might say, oh, that doesn't tell us quality brain waves, but it is still information. And in the hands of a skilled neurologist or a skilled clinician, it, those might be clues as to what's happening indirectly in the brainstem, in the cerebellum, in the um, upper brainstem, in, in the basal ganglia. These are types of things that show us what the cranial nerve nuclei are doing to the eyes what they're doing to the face and what they're doing to um, eye movements and eye movement reflexes. So um, furthermore, you might see brain waves that, that are just massively high amplitude everywhere. And, um, and very often those are indicative of, uh, and the medical profession uh, calls them, uh, in, in some cases where we have elevated delta waves and theta waves, we call those um, metabolic encephalopathy if it's above a certain standard deviation, if it's involving delta and theta waves, and if it's involving most of the brain. And, and if it's not too much artifact from, from other things like eye movements. So sometimes a brainwave scan will tell us about non-cortical things. It'll tell us about a sad and sick liver. It'll tell us about a sad and sick insulin system or a thyroid problem. It'll steer us toward looking at the metabolism and ordering more blood tests. It'll steer us toward looking at infl inflammation and injury. For, for example, perhaps the patient has just injured their ankle and they have a massively swollen ankle on one side and the inflammatory chemicals of that ankle are, are, are just sweeping through their body, crossing the blood-brain barrier. These cytokines of inflammation could be crossing their blood-brain barrier and invading their brain and bathing it in inflammatory chemicals. And it's coming from a, a, a twisted, swollen ankle. And we need to wait a few weeks for that to, to dis, uh, dissipate before we can get good brainwave data. So sometimes the brain pictures are not always the brain, and sometimes we get too involved in exercised about looking at the brain waves and over-interpreting them. And, and as clinicians we, and patients, we need to back up our focus and, and take a 30,000 foot view and look at these, these signals of the brain and try to figure out which department takes priority. The metabolic department and lab testing, other imaging outside of EEG, a better, deeper physical examination, neurological examination done by a skilled clinician that really knows what they're doing, a more detailed history of, of the family history, the history of surgery, the history of mental illness, the history of, of hospitalization and mental hospitalizations, the history of diet and metabolism. And gosh, one of my favorites is SNP testing, looking at the genes and finding out if they have gene combinations that might set them up for disaster if they're not very careful. Whereas some people don't have to be very careful. They have a, a wider band of, of, um, of functional range and other people have just a very narrow band that if they've got to stay within that band of, of diet and function, otherwise they just feel terrible and their bodies fall apart. And it's not their fault, it's just the genes and the combination of genes that they were born with. So uh, this essentially chapter is, is talking about 
what do the brain waves have to do with the rest of, of being a good doctor and being an astute patient?